table with Roxanne Mann and my buds aren't here. Summer, but that's the way it is in the world right now. Um, I'm gonna wait a little bit, see who else pops up here. I hope we have some people checking in. If you do check in, give us a thumbs up or um, give us a, a wow or a heart or something. Um, I'm hoping that this is even going. It says it's live, but anyway. Just to recap a little bit, we're in the book of Ephesians, and we got down to about 14 last week. So we are now going to start uh, talking a little bit about that. You know, uh, Paul, uh, he comes to this church of Ephesus, and he wants to give thanks to God for them. And he wants to uh, tell them how thankful he is for them and that he prays for them all the time because it has been said around that their great love was just an awesome thing. And it's a great witness when uh, we can show our love for one another and we can, um, you know, just let people know how very thankful we are. Well, um, Paul, in uh, the first chapter, he reminds us that he was elected. He was um, uh, chosen to be apostle, served for Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome when we're elected and chosen to be an apostle for Jesus Christ? And that's really when God calls us. That's really what we are. We're chosen to walk for him. Well, um, he speaks to other Christians to encourage them at this time. And if we realize through grace and mercy of Christ, any child, before they really get that peace, you know, come to know the peace of God, they first have to accept his grace. And what that means is we usually feel unworthy, but God's grace, when he touches us, lets us know, that he's the one that makes us worthy. We're not worthy within ourselves. We're righteous through his love and what he did for us on the cross. Okay, Paul tells us that we've been blessed with um, every spiritual blessing, gifts, in other words. He gives us, each and every one of us, he gives gives us gifts to use. Like, um, Oh, I just, I think about Terry LeMaster, you know, he gets on uh, live at night around nine o'clock, I think, and he's been gifted with music and he's got his own business, his own music store. So he will get on there and give actual lessons with the guitar, you know, for free, you know, he just shows you and it's, it's awesome. And I'm seeing that more and more that people are getting on live on the media and really uh, blessing others and teaching others what they know. And, and that, isn't that awesome? I just think that's great. And so are Christians and churches and just they're spreading out. And God's using that social media in a way like we've never seen before. And I know Zoom's probably picked up more clients than, than anything. And I was even thinking today about how us pastors could use Zoom. We could have like, even in you know, Wabash community, we could get a Zoom account and just have the, the pastors that like the WAMA, the Ministerial Association, and we could get on there and talk to one another. And because, and you know, we all feel so isolated right now. And really a pastor's job is to go out and meet people and talk to people and counsel with people and give them scripture and encourage them. And, and we just kind of feel lost, you know, <laughs> but um, never fear. God is here. He is here and he is working with us. And don't you ever think for one minute, where's God? Where's God in all of this? What's going on? He is still on the throne. He's still on the throne and he still rules people. Um, well, you know, when we come to know the Lord, we're like handpicked. He handpicked us. He handpicked us. You know, when you're going to looking for vegetables at the grocery store and stuff and you're picking through all those tomatoes, you know, you want that best ripe tomato, that one's round, you know, not too squishy, just firm, just right. He handpicked us. That's awesome to even think about, you know, because the enemy, he likes to come in and he likes to tell us how unworthy we are or 
how much we've messed up on stuff or how we can't do that. Well, who, who do we think we are anyway? Well, you know, God equips us to do the job. It's not best that we can, but it's never been enough until God comes in and equips us to do it. Uh, and many people, when they first come to know the Lord, you know, they'll say, I found God. And I'll smile because I think to myself, honey, God wasn't lost. He, he's never been lost. Uh, he's the one that found you. <laughs> but I remember feeling the same way when I came to know God, you know, I found Jesus. No, no, I was the one lost. I was the one that was lost. He found me. Satan, uh, he does us, he does the best to um, like whisper in our ear, we're not a true Christian because we had a bad thought or, or we're not redeemed, but we are. We're sealed. Once we're sealed, nobody can take that seal off of you, not unless it's God. But, uh, you know, I think about the businesses I see around, you know, they're all, I see their signs and stuff because I used to do signs years ago. And they all have a unique logo, like a Nike sign has a, a, a unique logo and, and uh, oh, Arby's and, you know, Burger King and all of them, they have their one unique logo. And sometimes you'll see the logo on hats and on t-shirts. And, and I think about God's logos, his words, you know, and I think about he's got his logo, you know, when he places the seal of the Holy Spirit, and when I say the Holy Spirit, I, I, you know, I want to remind you of something, Holy Spirit's person, and um, we in the church world have been taught and grown up to say the Holy Spirit, but let me tell you, when you would, like, if you would introduce me to people, you would say, I'd like you to meet Roxanne Mann. You wouldn't say, I'd like you to meet the Roxanne man. Um, it's just not proper grammar. <laughs> so when we say, I'm kind of trying to get in the habit of saying sweet Holy Spirit because he is so sweet. And he's our counselor. He's, he's our comforter, especially now at this time we're going through right now. You know, if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, but, you know, I don't know how people have hope without Jesus because God's the only answer for this crazy world we're living in. And uh, his Logos word, his seal of the Holy Ghost is placed on us. And uh, that's what Paul, Paul reminded us of in that. And that down to from 1 to 14 is that he's placed that on us and he's called us his own. He's elected us. He's handpicked us as the ripest and the best. And, and only we can be used for him because he, he, he chose us. You know, me of all people, I was thinking, you know, God, I know how to do so many things and I'm gifted a lot of stuff. But, you know, speaking to people just wasn't one that I ever thought I would do because um, but he reminded me of something the other day and you know, I got I have to share it with guys um, I'm really kind of a shy person and a friend of mine reminded me of this the other day she says you know you're kind of shy Pastor Roxanne and I'm like I was thinking well honey if you knew me in my day you wouldn't have thought I was shy one bit because uh, I like to drink a lot and uh, I like to party a lot and I like to dance, and the louder the music, the louder I was. I was pretty bold and loud, and and I was thinking about that yesterday as I was kind of going through this study, and I got to thinking, you know, I am so quiet because I watch my words now, and I just would rather not rock a boat, but the Lord reminded me of something. What would happen, he said, if you were just as bold and just as loud and just as fun as you were back then, but only now without the alcohol for me, you know, if I would go after Jesus, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, but if I'd go after Jesus with the same kind of passion and the same kind of thrill that I had about going after partying, what would us Christians do in this world? 
I mean, we're, we're called, the, the Word of God says we're peculiar people. And I, I started thinking about what a peculiar person was to me. I want somebody that stands out, right? Somebody who stands out and you think they're different. Maybe, maybe uh, they look a little different. Maybe they act a little different. It's more behavior, I think. And I started thinking about, you know, every, every now and then you run into one of them. Uh, the church likes to call them Jesus freaks. Well, they're all about Jesus and they let you know it. And they, uh, you know, I, I love that because they're unusual. They're peculiar. They're different because they're not, they don't care what you think. They don't actually do not care what you think. They're going to put their Jesus out there and put him up front. And I think that's awesome because that's what, if we showed our love more like that, this world would be changed in a heartbeat. Now, um, I forgot where I was at. I think I was t kind of going over a little bit of Ephesians, but um, sweet Holy Spirit, um, I love that. I don't know if you've ever heard that old uh, gospel song, Sweet Holy Spirit, but I love that song because it says, Sweet Holy Spirit. And I think about how when he comes and he comforts us, he just kind of surrounds us in his love, you know. And that's what he is to me is sweet. So instead of me saying the Holy Spirit, I say sweet Holy Spirit. Um, here in this first chapter of Ephesians, Paul prays for the church. He prays for the saints. Now, what, uh, what makes a saint? Now, I know Catholics, they kind of believe a saint has to be a really righteous person who's done a lot of good in the world and, uh, you know, made their mark as far as tradition goes, but really if you believe in Jesus Christ, you've asked him in your heart, you're following after his teachings, you're what the church would call a saint because you're a believer. You're now been reborn. Reborn means you've changed your behavior. You've changed your, you know, way of living and you now are living for him. And uh, I like to think of it as, I remember when I came to know God, uh, when I was born again, you know, I just totally felt new. The air smelled sweeter. The grass was greener. The leaves were brighter. I mean, it was like, it was like I took shades off my eyes and everything was just new. I, and, I, and I remember that and that stuck with me too. It's, and I, sometimes I think, um, sometimes I can, I think we can wear like that old song, rose colored glasses, you know, I think we have shades on our eyes until God enlightens us and he brings truth in. And then we see it for, see him for who he really is. Um, in Matthew 7, 7, it speaks to us about how, you know, um, uh, if we ask and we seek and we knock and pray that God will answer us. And I like to think of that as, you know, we'll keep on knocking, keep on knocking, keep on praying, keep on praying. And sometimes we, prayer is so very important. I think that's what Paul wants to get across here. He said he prayed without ceasing and that he prayed for us. Do you realize, I mean, have you really thought about it, that when he says here he's praying for the saints, uh, I know he was particularly talking about this one church, but he said he prayed for the saints continually. That means all the future saints. That means you. That means me. And I thought about that, and I thought, wow, Apostle Paul prayed for the saints. That means... You pray for me. Doesn't that encourage you? Doesn't that encourage you? It does me. Because I think of all the things that he went through. 
how he stood for Christ and how he got beaten and how he got, you know, shunned and spit on and uh, and the trials that he went through. And, and I just, I'm amazed. It gives me encouragement to stand for Jesus. You know, uh, in verse 15, it says, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. All the saints! Woo! Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. You know, ah, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. You know, uh, in this day we're living in right now with what's going on in the world, we need discernment. We need discernment. We need wisdom. We need knowledge. And the only place to get that is sweet Holy Spirit. So we need to pray and we need to ask and we need to seek and we need to knock because we need to know uh, if it's something to God, if it's something to man. You know, I I uh, think about praying for people. You know how you run into somebody and you say, I'll pray for you because they're going through something. I'll pray for you. And then you don't do it right away. And then for whatever reason, it kind of slips your mind. And then you, you went out of there without even praying for the person. And I, I don't think that's what God wants us to do. I think God wants us to be bold enough to wherever we're at, just take that person's hand or, or pray for that person right then. You know, right now we can't take their hand because of what's going on in the world, but we can certainly pray for them. You God, boundaries, reaches everywhere, believe me. It can reach across the world if it need be. There's some times that... I, uh, a name has just come to my mind. I don't know anybody named that name, but I'll pray for that person because I don't know. Maybe God's calling me to pray for that person for whatever reason. And there's sometimes I don't know how to pray. I mean, right now, sometimes I don't know how to pray because this is, this is a warfare we're fighting right now. And I know people have said that before, but it is actual war. There is a spirit behind this virus, believe me. And it's not from God. It is from the enemy. Uh, and it has a lot of fear behind it. So fear is, is, a, uh, is a spirit in itself. And we need to come against that as the body of Christ. You know, we don't need to have fear. God is our conqueror, amen? Um, this same church that he is talking about here in Ephesus, um, this same church that he is so proud of right now and praying for right now in, uh, in the book of Acts, I think it's 19, I'm not sure, but Acts and Revelation, it, he talks about the church, they lost their first love. So they become in a backslidden state. So that tells me that we can be born again, living for him, falling hard after him, uh, serving him with all we got, you know, praising him with all we got, and then we get comfortable. And we get complacent. Oh, and then it gets easy to sit in that recliner. No, I don't want to go out, you know. We get kind of in a backslidden state uh, we we get to where we don't love him like we first loved him. we don't I remember you meant I I remember being at work and working so hard at a job and being so stressful at my job and it was church night and I remember being so stressed out and so tired and just just I could not wait to get to church so I could feel the Holy Spirit and get my praise on and get that energy back. And you know, today most people would be like, "Man, I'm too tired to go to church." Ugh. They'd go home, sit in the recliner, and go to sleep, and they miss their church night. What? That's a backslidden state. 
because we're not running after God with that first love that we first had. Um, God's in control and he has the answer. That's for sure. Uh, let's see. Let's read verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory? His inheritance in the saints. Mm. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. <laughs> God's got the power. People today are trying to escape reality. You know that? Everything going out there in the world, they just want to forget it. They want to, oh, come on over. Let's have a party. Let's drink, you know. Let's smoke a little marijuana or, yeah, marijuana <laughs> and uh, get high. It's just not worry about it anymore because they're anxious. They're stressed out every day on the news. Coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. You know, it's coming to get you. No, heck no. Uh-uh. That's how I feel about that. You know, you put fear in your heart, and yeah, you're going to be afraid. But you put it out the door, <laughs> you're not going to be afraid. And God's word gives that to us. We can stand on his promise. You know, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. Now, I don't know if we could fully understand that or not, because I don't know that we fully know how to tap into that. You know what I'm saying? But I do know this. If we knew for sure how to tap into that, there would be a lot more things happening in this earth by God's church. And maybe that's why this is happening right now, that God is allowing it to shake up the church a little bit, to say, hey, get your house in order. You know, get your house in order. Wake up. Wake up. Giving people a chance to come to him. Because don't you think a lot of people are waking up over this? I do. I think they're waking up. I think they know there's no other way for hope but through God. There are times in our lives when Holy Spirit will come upon us, just like they did in the ancient days. You know, the Holy Spirit would come upon a person and give them extra supernatural anointing to accomplish something or do something. That still happens today. It's still the same. There's sometimes, um, I'll be preaching, and uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon me, and he'll give me a word for somebody, or he'll give me a word for the church, or he will allow me to maybe see something that he wants me to keep to myself or not ready to understand the interpretation of it yet because it's not time. Sometimes that happens. And it, there's sometimes it happens with other people differently. But, um, you know, when we start saying, eh, that's, that ain't God, you know, we're taking away his equipping. And I think that's terrible today when we think we put a finger on it because we're man and we don't understand supernatural stuff that eh you know uh that's not god or or uh you know we make fun of people that allow that type of anointing to touch their life it's a shame it's a shame because i think when jesus when he walked the earth he was a supernatural person. He allowed the gifting to work through him. He shook this world up. He did because he touched people when they were healed. He prayed for people when they stood up. Can you imagine today if we could tap into the same power? Huh. He gave us the authority. He gave us the authority. Now didn't he? I uh When you're learning something, I remember when I used to airbrush, well, I still do, but not like I did, but 
uh, years ago used to be really good at air. Well, I am still really good at airbrushing and uh, uh, to really, really hit that thing hard and get a perfection professional. I had to practice like 16 to 18 hours a day, day after day after day after day. And I had to touch in. And back then, you didn't really have the computers like you do now. So the only way I got my information was through tapping in to other people on, over the phone or something with their knowledge. And, um, and then it was maybe a year or two later after I first started that the computer came up and it was more available for me to get information and get on sites. But, you know, to be really good at something, I had to practice. And I went after it hard because I wanted it. I wanted it. I was interested in that art and I wanted it. So I went after it with everything I had in me. And uh, I got really good at it and became a professional and even got in magazines and, uh, you know, made my 15 minutes of fame, so to say. But when you want something bad enough, you go after it. Don't you think Jesus wants you to want him that much? To go after him, to seek after him hard, to search for him hard, to read his word, to ponder over his word, chew on his word, think and meditate about his word, what it means. He wants you to want him that much. I think for the people in the world today that's being woken up to him, maybe asking him into their hearts because of this, and I just think we are living in a historical moment, the church is, and how we choose to act on this is vitally important. I hope and pray that we pray for one another. I hope and pray that we show each other love because the next few weeks, the president says it's going to get kind of bad, and I tend to agree with him. I don't think they thought it would get this bad. There's more behind this, I think, than meets the eye. Um, it's not just a really bad spirit. I think the spirit snuck in a back door. I think the back door maybe had something to do with I don't want to get up on politics here, but you know what I mean. A little bit of the government, but they had no idea this spirit would take a crown like he did. Like, you know, Corona means crown, so he thinks he has authority. But we know who has authority, right? Uh-huh, we do. That's Jesus Christ, our Savior. Um, in verse 20, what are we reading yeah, I get it. Let's just read the rest here. Verse 20 through, down through uh, the end of the chapter. Which he brought about in Christ, which he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Mm. For above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in the age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subject under his feet. All things, all things under his feet. And gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is his body. Of the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, there's only two times I know of that Jesus stood up. See, he stands at the right hand, or sits at the right hand of the Father, sorry. Um, two times he stood up. Once when Stephen was being stoned. Remember when Stephen, right before he passed away, went to heaven to be with Jesus. Um, he was being stoned and he looked up and he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, the next time he stands up will be in Revelation when he takes the title deed to the earth, the uh, little book, and uh, 
he's then he takes it from the angel and that's his deed to the earth to be ruler of all things and um he stands for unity and uh jesus is the head of the church you know church is his body and when i say church i just don't mean our little church i mean the church all over the world everyone who is a follower you see people can say they believe but unless you follow after jesus teachings and practice them i don't know that you really are born again but uh, in revelations 5 i believe it talks about him taking the uh title back to the earth but anyway um jesus is the head of the church and the church is his body as scripture just said and uh, he wants to take care of his body. So, uh, you know, there's, you have certain leaders in church who kind of govern the church, but make no, um, no description here that uh, pastors on the head, I don't care what kind of deacon, elder, whatever you had, they're there to help govern the sheep but the pastor's not even the head of the church jesus christ is the head of the church and if the pastor is allowing jesus christ to be the head of the church it the church will be a, a pure body for him uh, we are his family after all he died for us you know, you think about your family and your loved one, your little girl or your little boy or uh, your husband, you know, you think about them. And if something was to come out in front of them, you know, like going to run them over or kill them or something like that. I know about you, if something was going to happen to one of my baby girls, uh, you know, I'd be like an old red rooster hen rah, running out there. You know, you're not touching my baby. You're not touching my family. And that's how Jesus Christ feels about us. The old enemy is not going to touch us because God has his hand on us. He's got his heel on us. So you can stand firm in that. He has great love for us. Yes, he does. You know, I think this time he's wanting the church to wake up through all this. You know, you. I always think about the scripture that he says, "If my people call on my name and humble themselves and pray, you know, he'll heal the land." That's a promise. That is a promise to heal the land if the church does what it's supposed to: pray and seek him and humble ourselves. Oh my! Humble ourselves. Well, I hope you enjoyed the study today, and um, I just want, hi, everybody, good to see you all, and I don't, I didn't get your comments, but I'll read them later, and I'll pray later, but I would just like to say a little prayer over you today, and uh, send this to people, get the word out, you know, tell them about our study, you know, and, and uh, the Lord's Table, we do live at 1030 on Sunday mornings, and I'm going to try a different video way. I know it's been coming in and out, but uh, I'm going to actually use my phone this next time and see if that doesn't help. But anyway, um, uh, you know, share share the page. Uh, thumbs up and stuff to everybody, but let's pray, and I want to pray uh, protection over you today, okay? Father God, we just come before you, Lord. I am so very thankful for each and every person, Lord, watching. I'm so thankful, God, for each and every believer all over the face of this earth, Father God. And Lord, I just ask that you would touch your people right now, God. I ask for an extra hedge of protection around them, Father God. I ask that you put your warrior angels around them, Jesus, to fight off any kind of viral infection or corona 19 or whatever from attacking them father lord you've placed your seal upon them god they've been handpicked and elected for you jesus and we just know that we 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 are protected we will not stand in fear 
for we belong to you. Lord, I ask that your face would shine upon them, that you would go to their homes, their territory, their jobs, Lord God, that you would hold on to them for them, Father God. And when this mess is over, that would we would give you the greatest hallelujah praise Jesus there ever was. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I know I can get a little bit riled up sometimes, but forgive me. Bye-bye.